Thank you very much, Rector, Holberg Prize Laureate, distinguished guests, colleagues, and friends. Professor Kokka, it is indeed a great pleasure to welcome you back to Norway three years after you received the Holberg Prize, the Ludwig Holberg Memorial Prize in Bergen. The Ludwig Holberg Memorial Prize was established by the Norwegian Parliament in 2003. The prize is administered by the University of Bergen on behalf of the Ministry of Education and Research. The University of Bergen has appointed a board for the Ludwig Holberg Memorial Prize. Every year, the Ludwig Holberg Memorial Prize awards two prizes, the main Holberg Prize and the Nils Klim Prize, both within the academic fields of arts and humanities, social sciences, law and theology. The prizes are intended to raise the status of the fields covered by the prizes and to increase society's awareness of research in these fields. The prizes are awarded by the board on behalf of the University of Bergen and on the recommendation of academic committees, which consist of outstanding uh, scholars in the relevant academic fields. The formal award ceremony for the Holberg Prize and the Nils Klim Prize takes place in Håkonshallen in Bergen every year in June. Let me remind you that uh, this year's prize ceremony on June the 4th, Professor Michael Cook from Princeton University will receive the Holberg Prize. And the Nils Klim Prize will be awarded to Professor Terje Lundahl, originally from this part of Norway, but now affiliated with the Norwegian University of Science and Technology in Trondheim. The Holberg Prize is awarded to uh, scholars who have made, made outstanding contributions to research in the arts and humanities, social science, law or theology either within one discipline or uh, through uh, interdisciplinary work. The prize winner must have had a decisive influence on the international research. The prize is worth 4.5 million Norwegian kroner, making it one of the most important prizes in the world in these fields. The equivalent of the Nobel Prize, we like to say. This year, we are celebrating the 10th anniversary of the Holberg Prize by inviting previous laureates to come back to Norway to give le public lectures at Norwegian universities. This Holberg Lecture Series started at the Norwegian University of Science and Technology last month, and it is continuing here today. Then there will be lectures also at the universities of Nordland later this month, Stavanger in September, and Bergen in November. I would like to extend our great gratitude to the University of Agder, to Rector Torin Laufdal and her colleagues for organizing today's lecture by Jürgen Kokka. In 2011, Jürgen Kokka was the eighth scholar to receive the Holberg Prize. The academic committee then stated that Jürgen Kokka is an outstanding historian who affected a paradigm shift in German historiography by opening, opening it up to related social sciences and establishing the importance of cross-national comparative approaches. His works represent a monumental achievement in the histories of labor, the European bourgeoisie and corporations, exploring many aspects of social stratification and the continuously changing nature of work. Kokka is a public intellectual whose engagement with memory construction and the politics of history promotes enlightened and democratic institutions and leads him to struggle against exclusions, privileges and inequalities. Jürgen Kokka is among the most influential historians working today. Today, Jürgen Kokka is the second Holberg Prize laureate to give the Holberg Lecture on the topic European Integration and its present crisis, a historical perspective. Professor Kokka, the floor is yours. Please welcome him. Please. Thank you very
Yeah, Rector Lepel, Rector Grönmo, dear colleagues, guests, ladies and gentlemen. It's a great pleasure to be here. We enjoy being here. Thanks for the great hospitality we already enjoyed over the last two days. And uh, it's not only interesting, but also pleasant to learn about this new uh, universities with its two campuses and in this beautiful region. European integration and its present crisis is a historical perspective. Uh, many people um, think that the European Union um, is, I quote, the most exciting and sensational development in post-World War II European history. For centuries, Europe has been known to be the most belligerent uh, continent on Earth, uh, with continuous wars between its major powers, which spread their struggles into the world. In the first half of the 20th century, Europeans, though of course not all Europeans, generated several extremely repressive dictatorships and devastating world wars. In the second half of the 20th century, however, Europe seems to have become another continent, increasingly unified, an area of peace, constitutional government, to some extent democracy and welfare. Some of us think that building this new Europe uh, has been the single most important lesson which the contemporaries learned uh, from the second, in the second half from the first half of the 20th century. But in recent years and in the present moment, it doesn't look that good. The process of European integration seems to be in trouble. Within several member states, uh, anti-integration forces are on the rise, and serious voices discuss the possibility that Europe may disintegrate again into its parts. National identity and even nationalism seem to come back. Maybe 100 years from now, historians will look back on the late, ninth, late 20th, early 21st century as, a, as one lucky but exceptional period in which Europe managed to unite and be stable before turning back into its century-old habit of disunity and conflict. This is the question I, which I want to discuss from a historical point of view, uh, using the notion of challenge and response. I want first to discuss how European integration started between the late 1940s and uh, mm, the Treaty of Rome 1957, which led to the European Economic Commu Community of 1958. Um, I will then concentrate on the period between the mid-1980s and about 2005, 2007, when something like a relaunching of uh, the European Union took place, including the transformation of the European Economic Community into a European Union in 1992, and of course the extension to the East. And then I will talk about the present crisis of integration. Finally, I will draw some conclusions um, with respect to the topics democracy, capitalism, and crisis. I think I will skip the last uh, uh, paragraph due to problems of time. So the idea of the uh, European Federation is old, uh, has been voiced again and again since the 16th century, but without effect. The idea got stronger in the 1920s as a reaction to World War I. And again, during and right after World War II, 
for instance, in anti-fascist uh, resistance groups uh, since the early 1940s. But concrete steps uh, towards European unification were not taken before the beginning of the Cold War. It was in late 1946 and early 1947 that the United States um, started to give priority to a policy of containment um, of anti-Soviet, anti-communist containment. And it is in this context that the United States started to favor a quick recovery of uh, Western Europe, including the defeated Germans, as far as they lived outside the Eastern uh, influence. It was this policy context that it was in this policy context that the United States started to propose a close cooperation, even federation, between the European states outside the Soviet sphere of influence. Besides um, the founding of NATO, the Marshall Plan was a centerpiece in this American strategy. It did not only offer about 13 million US dollars, today about 130 billion, US dollars in worth to restore and strengthen the West European economies, but it also obliged the 16 or 17 uh, receiver countries to cooperate. Um, so trade and payments between them were to be organized multilaterally. The American push towards uh, a uh, kind of West uh, European Federation became even stronger when the Korean War uh, intensified the increasingly global uh, East-West conflict since 1950. Adjusting to this new European policy of the United States, French policymakers, uh, Jean Monnet and Robert Schuman among them, moved away from the previously held goal of keeping Germany weak and its uh, heavy industry under French control, protecting France against the possible threat from an eventually uh, re-strengthened Germany remained a basic motive uh, of French and other European policymakers. But for reaching this aim, now they generated a multinational alternative. French and German coal and steel industries were lumped together and jointly put under the control of a newly founded international authority in which the French would maintain a strong hand. Defeated Germany, that is West Germany under Konrad Adenauer, were glad to accept this, uh, since it would help them to regain uh, some degree of equality in the international arena. Belgium, the Netherlands, Luxembourg, and Italy also accepted to join. Um, and actually, the Benelux countries played a very active role in the few the following years. There was also much support by business interests uh, who realized that this arrangement would safeguard them against all kinds of socialism. And they expected that such a step towards a larger uh, market would offer new opportunities. The United Kingdom uh, gave support without getting directly involved. All this led to the European uh, coal and steel community of 1952. This supranational um, institution stood for a collectively regulated form of capitalism in the then dominant uh, sectors of coal and steel. It stood against all socialist alternatives of government control and central planning, then very much uh, discussed and supported in Europe and urgently requested by large parts of the European left. 
but it also stood against uh, the tradition of economic nationalism, so strong during the previous periods. The authority was established in Brussels with a high commissioner at the top, with a controlling council of ministers, with a common assembly, with delegates from the member countries' parliaments, and with a court of justice to settle disputes. With all these institutions, this new European coal and steel community of 1952 displayed in Nutze uh, the organs which we later find in the European Economic Community and in the European Union until today. From there, from this uh, European community of coal and steel, there was no automatic uh, spillover into other branches and sectors, with some few exceptions. And attempts at more political and military integration failed in the 1950s. But the six countries, the same political forces and, 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 and the Zeitgeist, uh, which had brought about this agreement on coal and steel, continued to be strong, strong enough to allow hammering out among the governments of the six the Treaty of Rome of 1957. The Treaty of Rome envisioned the abolishment of all custom borders and trade restrictions, all obstacles to freedom of movement of persons, services, and capital. That is a common market, not just for coal and steel, but for all goods and all factors of production. This Treaty of Rome also advocated economic policies, common economic policies in special spheres like agriculture and transport and certain elements even of a common social policy. And it advocated the reduction of economic policy um, differences and the certain harmonization of uh, economic growth in Europe. It even envisioned a shared commitment to solidarity, liberty, and peace. This way, the treaty went beyond trade policies, and it envisioned economic integration in a very broad sense. And the, tr the treaty, of course, obliged its six uh, signatory states, but it clearly looked beyond them at Europe as a whole without defining its borders, by aiming at, I quote, an ever closer union among the peoples of Europe. This was a far-reaching, very ambitious document. It would, take, it would take decades to accomplish the aims it spelled out, but it has never been reversed. And it created dynamics beyond itself those who did not join felt it to be helpful also to join forces, though to a more limited extent. In 1960, seven other European countries founded the European Free Trade Area, EFTA, three Scandinavian countries, and the United Kingdom among them. Now, looking on the decades following the Treaty of Rome and simplifying a highly complex story for the sake of brevity, we can distinguish between two phases. A period of relative stagnation in which elements of crisis built up because the community was unable to adjust to major challenges and um, of the time, until the mid-1980s, roughly. And secondly, a subsequent period uh, of major reforms, which amounted to something like a relaunching of Europe between the mid-1980s 
and let's say 2007. The single act of 1987, the Maastricht Treaty, creating the European Union in 1992, the extension of the Union towards the East, and the Reform Treaty of Lisbon, nine, 2007, are the most important dates to remember. Extension was controversial, highly controversial. But in 1973, the United Kingdom, Ireland, and Denmark entered, while, Den while Norway abstained. In 1981, Greece came in. And in 1986, Portugal uh, and Spain. So the community of six uh, developed into a community of 12. Its heterogeneity grew. The finding of consensus became more difficult. This made the need for internal reform even more urgent. In order to accomplish the aims set out by the Treaty of Rome and at other occasions, the community needed some streamlining of decision-making processes. But the major players blocked one another, and not much happened until the mid-1980s. There was increasingly another problem of governance which plagued the community in the 80s more than in the 50s. While the number of issues and topics to be decided in Brussels continuously grew, the democratic basis of these decisions remained extremely weak. Although the members of the European Parliament uh, since 1979 were elected directly, the influence of this parliament remained very limited. The main power was yielded by non -very, not very transparent intergovernmental bodies or by commissioners and civil servants appointed but not elected. But over the decades, European public opinion in several countries became more demanding with respect to democratic principles. Consequently, the communities, the European communities, basic deficiency as to democratic decision making or democratic legitimation was increasingly criticized. Most important, the economic landscape in which the European community acted profoundly changed. Economic growth in most parts of Europe slowed down after 1973. Globalization accelerated. As a consequence, Europe had to face much fiercer competition. The rise of finance capitalism and the so-called neoliberal deregulation took place in several parts of the world, also in several parts of Europe, to some extent. And the third industrial revolution, the IT-based uh, third industrial revolution, began. New fields and branches became important, which had hardly existed in the 1950s when the procedures and the structures of the uh, community had been hammered out. And the European community found it difficult to adjust and to respond to these changes. Take all this together and you will not be surprised that contemporary observers and historians looking back have diagnosed stagnation and even crisis of the community for the late 60s, 70s, and early 80s. In that time, eurosclerosis uh, became a polemical catchword used by an increasing number of contemporaries in a critical way. 
Now, how did the European Union overcome this crisis? Let me stress what I see as the two main bundles of uh, factors. First, the pressure of the crisis mounted. The feeling became widespread and in a way painful that Europe's competitiveness fell behind. At the same time, a new constellation of political leaders um, made a difference. Jacques Delors, an extremely able and inspired policymaker, became president of the commission in 1985. His bold but uh, systematic initiatives were fully supported by Helmut Kohl and François Mitterrand, the German, West German chancellor and the French minister president, who by then had learned to work together very well, and both of them were convinced Europeans. A new fresh wind started to blow in the community. The Schengen Treaty of 1985 abolished uh, border controls, first among five West European countries. Later on, others joined. Innovative investment programs were brought on the way in transportation, research and development, in regional policies with uh, the aim of harmonizing economic uh, development in different parts of Europe. The single European Act was passed in 1986, which initiated some reforms of the community's internal structure, but it also finally implemented uh, some not yet realized goals of market integration already uh, acclaimed by the Treaty of Rome. And it, this single act of 1986 targeted monetary union to advance and complete economic integration. So all this was well on the way before 1989. The community reacted to crisis by jumping ahead. The second bundle of factors, the breakdown of the Soviet empire, the end of institutionalized communism, and the liberation of East European countries from Soviet hegemony between 1989 and 1991, generated new dynamics. The Cold War ended, the Iron Curtain fell, the line disappeared which had categorically divided Europe between West and East for more than four decades. This was a challenge to the European community. Euro European integration so far had been West European integration. The European community was a product and a part of Western Europe. How would such a community deal with the loss of its basic challenger in the East and with the possibility of extending towards the East. But this rupture in Eastern Europe was also a big opportunity. Return to Europe had been the slogan with which uh, the East European dissidents and demonstrators had challenged Soviet hegemony and the dictatorial structure of their governments in 1989. After exiting communism and after some discussions, the East European countries uh, demanded to join the European community for economic reasons, for political, sometimes also for security reasons. This uh, European community had always claimed to ideally encompass Europe as a whole. Now, this became a real possibility. And there was an interesting and intrins intrinsic relationship between German reunification and European integration. 
the reemergence of a unified, strengthened Germany was more acceptable, perhaps only acceptable to its neighbors, as long as Germany was solidly embedded um, in a well-integrated Europe. While on the other hand, Germany, in order to get her reunification, was ready to push ahead fast and uh, go along further with European integration, even if that meant to give up something, to give up something like her own currency, the German mark, uh, so dear to many Germans. So European integration and German reunification um, uh, pushed and reinforced each other. The community decided in favor of fast and radical extension. Sweden, Finland, and Austria decided to join in 1995. They were very welcome. It was more complicated with the post-communist countries in the East. It would need some time to practice integration with them, economically, socially, and culturally. Western businesses streamed into the newly opened territories right away, looking for markets and cheap labor. Exchange programs were developed. A lot of money was transferred from Western Europe into Eastern Europe. The East European countries had to reform their political systems in order to fit the principles and values of the European community. They did it to a large extent, in a, to an impressive extent over the years. And this helped to transform post-communist Europe in a basically peaceful and non-turbulent way, with the exception of the war on the Balkans. And I see this as a very beneficial effect of the existence and of the attractiveness of the European Union. In 2004 and uh, 2007, 12 new member states were formally admitted, extending what was now called the European Union far to the east, to the borders of Russia, Belarusia, and the Ukraine. So what had started as a community of six was now a community of 27. And interestingly enough, in those years, extension of the Union and deepening, consolidating the Union went together, hand in hand. In the Maastricht Treaty of 1992, a new name, European Union, was adopted, a signal of indefensified unification. The decision in favor of a common currency was codified. A common currency for those member states who wanted it and who would fulfill certain conditions, especially with respect to their sovereign debt, um, which would have to stay below certain limits. A strong European Central Bank was uh, founded. And in 2002, the common currency, the euro, became reality, first for 12, now for 17 members. The supranational elements of the union, in contrast to its intergovernmental elements, uh, uh, was strengthened were strengthened. And its ability to reach common decisions on relatively democratic grounds was improved by upgrading the role of the parliament in the Treaty of Maastricht 1992, by extending the number of policy fields in which qualified majorities, majority decisions would do and anonymity would not be necessary. 
and by making it easier to further advance in two or more speeds. That means, for instance, some member states, but not all, have joined the euro. Important members like Britain and Sweden decided to stay with their own currencies. Or the Schengen Agreement binds most uh, member countries, some others too, but not all. This way, the union's flexibility, but also its heterogeneity, increased. Over the years, Brussels had tried to broaden its responsibilities by, extend, by expanding and extending the number of policy fields in which Europe-wide cooperation could and should take place beyond the community's core business, beyond uh, uh, economic and financial concerns and flanking policies. Now, 1992, and following years, justice and home affairs were added, and to a limited extent, foreign policy. The position of a high representative of the Union for foreign affairs and security policy was uh, created. As you know, EU member states have continued to disagree on major foreign policy issues, and its diplomatic service has remained very rudimentary. Still, this broadening of the Union's competencies has remained very controversial among member countries, for instance, Britain. All these important steps uh, of deepening integration and consolidating the Union were finally codified in the form of intergovernmental agreements and treaties, particularly in the uh, Reform Treaty of Lisbon, 2007. But it's indicative that the attempt of doing this in the form of a new European constitution failed. The draft of a constitution was prepared by a constitutional convention over years, and it was supported by the governments of most uh, member states, but it died when referenda, referenda in France and the Netherlands voted it down in 2005. The fate of this constitution makes clear that popular resistance against continuously advancing towards an ever closer and ever more penetrating union had not disappeared at all, but was perhaps growing again towards the end of this phase of um, about 20 years in which the integration of Europe had been promoted and accelerated so much. This is basically where we stand today. There is more European integration now than ever. The European Union stretches over a larger period, of a lar over a larger territory, I want to say, than ever before, encompassing 28 states and more than 500 million people. and it may be further enlarged in the near future. No country has left the Union so far. The Euro is strong. It has not collapsed as uh, predicted by many in 2011 and 12. The European economies have started to grow again after, after some difficult years, in spite of many problems they couldn't, they still have. On the 25th of this month, a new European Parliament will be elected. The campaign is on. 
although it's less passionate than campaigns for national uh, elections usually are. For the first time, top candidates uh, from competing parties present themselves as candidates for the union's top leadership position, for the presidency of the European Commission. So for the first time, a popular election will more or less uh, decide about who gets into this powerful position at the top. We should keep this in mind when we talk about the present crisis of the European Union. Still, problems have grown over the last years. We can observe that popular support for European integration has somewhat declined in public opinion service, although in most member countries it's still a minority who would prefer to get out. In most countries, political positions, groups, and parties have gained weight, which define themselves as Euroskeptical or Euro or of Europe, uh, uh, Euroskeptical or critical or hostile vis-a-vis -vis, uh, uh, European unification and advocate basic change, either by some form of re-decentralization, uh, that is more autonomy for the single uh, nation states, or by advocating leaving the union, or by advocating breaking it up altogether. These are minorities, but uh, analysts think that in the upcoming election, taking together these, uh, skept these uh, critical uh, groups and parties might get some as much as 20%. The British government, under domestic pressure, has promised to hold a referendum about whether to leave the Union after renegotiating its terms and getting some power transferred back from Brussels to the uh, nation states. Harsh criticism uh, and strong protest uh, is voiced in several countries against some policies of the Union, for instance, against the amount of financial transfer it organizes into crisis-ridden member countries, or the opposite, uh, against the austerity um, policies dictated by Brussels to those who receive these bailouts. Brussels, or Europe, is held responsible for different grievances like mass unemployment or rising inequality or the influx of immigrants. Europe serves as a projection service surface against which one can blow off one's anger. National prejudices and stereotypes reappear in the political arena and can be instrumentalized for populist purposes. And serious authors, intellectuals, Social scientists uh, analyze the internal contradictions uh, of the union in sometimes in an alarmist tone, especially the unsolved problems of the union's political economy, its democratic deficiencies, and sometimes its artificial abstract character. And even within the still huge pro-integration camp, um, people are less certain about how to define the finalité, the ultimate goal of this process of integration. Should it be some kind of United States of Europe? There are those who support this view, continue to support this view. But there's also many, who, also many who doubt it. Maybe we have to redefine the aims 
And maybe we should be striving for a more hybrid uh, solution. After all, the national states are not going to go away. And uh, subsidiarity may be an important principle. Now, these are the phenomena which prompt some observers to speak about a crisis of European integration today. What has happened? I think most important was the sequence of financial and economic crises which, uh, which were initiated by the collapse of 2008, which in the European Union, especially in the uh, Eurozone, developed a specific dynamics uh, and became a specific burden. Like in the US and in the UK, major Eurozone countries uh, housed banks and investment firms and other financial institutions uh, which were part of the risky and irresponsible speculation waves um, which led to the breakdown of 2008. Here in the Eurozone, like in other parts of the world, not everywhere, some of them were about to go bankrupt, but succeeded in convincing governments that they were too big or too important to fail, and that they needed to be bailed out with tremendous sums of public money. In the Eurozone, like in other parts of the world, the government stepped in and shouldered the crisis which raised the public indebtedness to unprecedented levels and burdened both the budgets and the future of these countries, very much to the anger of many citizens. Again, these were problems not specific to the Eurozone uh, or to the European Union. But in the case of the Eurozone, these unpleasant aspects of the most recent capitalist crisis led to some additional ills and uncovered some structural weaknesses of the Eurozone architecture. First, being part of the Eurozone, although economically very weak, some countries at the southern periphery or at the periphery, like Greece, managed over the years before 2008, managed to take up loans and accumulate sovereign debt to an extent they would never have been able to collect if not under the umbrella of the common currency. This, the construction of the euro made such a misdirection of resources possible, even invited it. Now, after 2008, when due to the crisis, uh, additional debt burdens had to be shouldered, the annual debt and the accumulated debt of these countries jumped on extremely high levels on which these countries found it finally difficult to refinance themselves on the international loan and capital markets. State bankruptcies were imminent in the case of Greece, Portugal, and Ireland, partly also in Spain, later in Cyprus. Without the euro, this probably would not have been the case. Without being part of the eurozone, these countries would have been compelled to reduce spending earlier and start saving earlier. Second, the rules governing the common currency euro include no provision for how to deal with the bankruptcy of a single member case, of a single member state. There were and there are no rules for exiting. This way, the sovereign debt crisis of a few member states threatened to become a crisis of the euro in general. The member states and the European Central Bank reacted 
by mobilizing huge bailout sums, either in the forms of, form of loans or in the form of guarantees, Bürgschaften. They were transferred to the endangered countries, but not without uh, conditions and not without obligations attached, compelling the receiver countries to practice more fiscal uh, discipline and accept basic reforms, many of which proved tremendously painful, particularly for the lower and middling classes, unemployment slowing growth slowed down, impoverishment, loss of status. These bailing out actions were successful in that they prevented a breakdown of the currency. And they have served, they have started to bring back the crisis-ridden countries on their own feet, have started to do so. But they had huge social and political costs. Anger and protest built up in the giver states against what many saw as a too generous transfer into other countries and against uh, the constitutionally problematic procedures with which some of these uh, rescue missions uh, uh, frequently under immense time pressure had been uh, performed. But anger and protest also built up in the receiver countries against the required austerity measures dictated by the wealthy countries in the north. A new form of colonialism was deplored. All this has left scars which have not yet been healed. A deep distrust in the European Union has been one of the consequences, including sometimes the quest uh, to get out. And thirdly, this uh, crisis result, uh, this crisis uh, revealed structural weaknesses of the whole construction. As economists had protected and warned against, when the euro was installed in the early 1990s, basically on political grounds, it is tremendously difficult, if not impossible, to have a common currency without a common fiscal policy. But the member states of the union continue to be nation states, which resist giving up core elements of their sovereignty. And budget decisions are seen as belonging to this core of uh, sovereignty. Now in the crisis, this contradiction became painfully visible. It became also clear how different the European countries, how different the countries within the Eurozone really still are and that the 10 years under a common currency have not reduced these differences, but sometimes on the contrary. So what can be done? Some observers and politicians, many neoliberal economists among them, advocate to shrink the Eurozone in order to make it more sustainable or to divide it up, or to give it up altogether. It was generated on political grounds, they say, on the basis of a promise which it could not fulfill. Let's face the facts. Let's give it up. It will be to everybody's benefit, at least to the benefit of the giver countries. But an even larger group, mainly of, um, of advisors and policy makers, many politically thinking persons among them, um, <clears throat> demand more cooperation and more mutual control in fiscal policy affairs as to raising state income and as to spending. They say 
that in order to maintain the common currency, more integration is necessary. They say, let's use the crisis to get more integration in Europe, not less, at least in the Eurozone. In the first scenario, the crisis of integration would lead to less integration on this scale to a major step back. In the second scenario, the crisis would trigger another jump ahead on the road towards more integration, more Europe instead of less. Most of our governments are presently nearer to the second uh, than to the first scenario. There's a broad consensus in favor of maintaining the euro, though not at any cost. Small steps are being taken in the direction of a common fiscal policy, more coordination, and even more regulation. The new banking union, which has been decided upon, although not yet realized, is probably the best example. In fact, there is a lot of sharing risks and liabilities across borders. But this is not explicitly acknowledged because it would be politically difficult to legitimate. It might strengthen anti-integrationist reactions. So one tries to get on by muddling through. There are some successes, but there is no guarantee of success. Let me quickly conclude. Under three headings, democracy, capitalism, crisis. European integration has never contradicted democratic principles. Throughout the decades, integration has been compatible with constitutional representative democracy. And over the decades, its democratic elements have gradually been strengthened. But it cannot be denied that European integration has not been a bottom-up, but rather a top-down uh, process. More a project of enlightened elites than of popular movements. Probably European integration would not have been succeeded, would not have succeeded to the extent that it succeeded if it had been attempted and structured as a democratic bottom-up process. Nor can its present difficulties be solved by a radical move towards more direct democracy, as some observers think, in the form of referenda or in the form of a fully-fledged politicization. But we live in a democratic era. Further democratization of European integration step by step will be a condition of its long-term success. But it's not easy. Citizenship, in the full sense of the word, has developed within nation states. And the nation state remains not the only, but a major space in which citizenship can flourish. Secondly, capitalism. The history of European integration has been closely interconnected with the history of 20th century capitalism. European integration started together with the Cold War in which capitalist principles were ascertained and defended against socialist challenges and communist alternatives. Support from business interests, capitalist dynamics, and successful economic growth have been major motors, engines, of European integration throughout the decades. And the present crisis 
of integration is closely intertwined with the present crisis of capitalism, particularly finance capitalism. One will not be solved without the other. You see, there is much interconnection between European integration and capitalism. But European integration has never been the result of primarily economic interests or economic decisions, but primarily of political considerations and goals, actually the result of a delicate combination between political and economic decisions with some priority on the political side. And the European community since 1958 uh, and the European Union since 1992 stand for and are structured by a type of capitalism which one can call organized uh, or co coordinated capitalism. It is a form of capitalism with a lot of negotiations and committees and rules and regulations. It is compatible, it's a type of comp capitalism compatible and dependent on a strong welfare state and compatible with democratic elements of co-determination. This is why social democracies, social democrats, all over Europe did, after some hesitation, finally support most of the steps towards European integration, including, by the way, the Scandinavian social democracies. The EU is not a product of neoliberalism. Yes, it was influenced by the neoliberal zeitgeist of the 90s. It had to but it basically resisted it and survived. The EU was not born in a neoliberal mood. It was always more than a mere free trade area. The capitalism for which the union stands is not the Anglo-American model of market radical capitalism. At the same time, the organized capitalism of the European continental type clearly also differs from state, social, from state capitalism as we observe it in East Asia or Russia or other parts of the world by limiting government, by due process of law, and by guaranteeing a degree of autonomy to markets and civil society. This type of organized capitalism for which the EU stands in the way also most Scandinavian countries stand, needs further development. It still has to find better ways of dealing with the explosive effects of globalization, but in the light of worldwide comparisons, it nevertheless may be our best hope. Finally, a word on crisis and on the core mechanism of European integration. European integration has not been a step-by-step -step implementation of a grand design or a blueprint in the heads of policymakers and elites. Rather, it has been a process driven by the rise of ever new problems and newly engineered solutions to these problems. Original driving forces have disappeared, the Cold War as an example, or become much weaker, the memory of the catastrophes of the Second World War and around, another example. But other constellations have emerged which have replaced the original driving forces and turned out to be equally powerful. For instance, globalization, which makes any return to the nation state as the sole or dominant frame of action 
uh, hopeless um, regression. So, and also over the decades, the internal coherence, the practical interdependencies, the convergence of Europe have clearly become stronger, more effective. Partly a product of the European communities and European Union's policies, and clearly at the same time an important condition for further integration in the future. The transfer money going from the European community and the European Union to East European countries and to the periphery has been 14 times the sum of the Marshall Plan money coming from the United States to Europe. The budget of the European Union in the mid-1990s was 30% uh, um, um, meant for transfer money from the richer countries to the poorer countries. There has been a tremendous uh, work on territorial equalization against other factors. Over the decades, the process of integration has become institutionalized, creating rules and habits, and also groups who profit from integration, raising the costs which have to be paid if one wants to exit, or even destruct this process. These are strong mechanisms of path dependency. The process has gained a momentum of its own, which makes continuation more likely. I end with a quote by Jean Monnet. He wrote, looking back, I have always believed that Europe would be built through crisis. This may be overdone, but in fact, um, the neither fully blend nor fully contingent process of integration was uh, strongly influenced uh, by crisis, which have played a major role. And I hope I have made this clear in this lecture. Crisis, like the present one, can be productive. But there is no guarantee that they will be productive. And as usual, the historical process is open, or at least open, appears to be open, in the eyes of a historian. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you uh, very much for, again, a very elegant, elaborate, and interesting lecture. Um, elegant is the first word that comes to my mind when I hear your lectures, because they're so well-structured, and they form so strong uh, sentences and theses and arguments, so it's easy for not only the people who listen to them, but people who study them and, and work along the same line as you two. To, to grasp your points and bring them further. That's my experience, not only as a young scholar that way back, but also, also today when, when uh, I listen to uh, and guide young students who uh, read uh, your work. So again, it, it, uh, uh, thank you, thank you. Uh, we are going to have a, a small exchange of questions and comments, and uh, I would like you to raise your hand if you have a question and comment and I would like you to state your name, and I think we shall hand over the microphone, or, uh, yes, this microphone, so, so, um, so you will have a chance to, to uh, be recorded as well. Okay, so I'll hand the microphone out, you will answer uh, on the, this other, other microphone, and I will come to you with the, phone, uh, the microphone now. Thank you. My name is uh, Jarle Trondal uh, from the University of Agde. I think the, uh, thank you for a very nice presentation. Um, uh, on the last point of crisis and uh, advancement, I think crisis is a, a nice opportunity to 
study the effects on the sustainabil sustainability of, of the process of integration? Will it stop? And it also asks questions about the sustainability of the system. Will it break down? And from your lecture, it seems uh, uh, that uh, you're negative on both, in the sense that the process will not stop and the system will not break down. Uh, and the question is then, is the EU particularly good at, at surviving crisis compared to other systems? And if so, why? Uh, and it seems one of the answers that you suggest is that uh, the crisis is, in a sense, embedded into the EU system. It was born out of crisis, and it is um, it's a um, lot of um, rules, traditions, path dependencies uh, for uh, tackling crisis uh, through summit governance, through the trust among elites in committees, as you suggest, uh, and in a sense that the crisis rescued the EU more than the other uh, opposite. That crisis make uh, uh, at least the elite call for more common regulation and more common capacities. But could it, so that's one, suge one suggestive explanation for why the EU might be very good at tackling crisis and learning from it. But could another explanation in addition be that the EU is a very advanced government system with a high degree of specialization? Uh, or you can, so, so if, if the EU is a very advanced kind of government system with a lot of loosely coupled uh, policy areas, we could assume perhaps that a crisis such as an, eco an economic crisis only affects certain parts of it, such as, so in the, for example, in the European Commission, that certain DGs would be heavily influenced and stressed by a crisis, whereas in other parts of the Commission there will be business as usual. If you look at the statistics of, of legislative, uh, legislative output, it has not declined in most of the DGs uh, in the EU. So would that be a, a possibility also for an explanation that a crisis does not necessarily affect the system as a whole, but parts of it? Yeah. Yes, I see the point. Um, in the case of Greece, it has been discussed quite a bit. I do not know the internal papers, of course. But what you could get from the media, and there's a lot in the media on these things, uh, was the idea, why don't we cut losses and get rid of Greece? It's such a hopeless situation. They have lived over their, beyond their means tremendously for 15 years. And it's so hard to see how the necessary reforms can be uh, put through. But the decision went into the other direction. Although Greece will be a place into which money has to go from other parts of the European Union for a long time to come. And every knows, everybody knows that. The Greeks know it too. Uh, nevertheless, it has been decided to uh, not to try to split them off. Why? Because apparently this confidence in the euro rests uh, also on the relative success of parts of the system. It may get a showing that the system at large cannot even defend such a small part of its own. Uh, questions its uh, credibility with respect to investors, markets, and, and other groups around. And so the damage produced from getting rid of some parts for the whole may be larger in estimation than the, profit, than the advantages you might have by uh, separating yourself from a very problematic part. So it seems to me that the mechanisms which allow 
localization of crisis are not well developed in the European Union. Its strength depends on its interdependencies. Um, this does not mean by necessity to keep all the members in. Maybe one should work on developing mechanisms which might make exit easier. In the moment, however, this seems to be the situation. One more sentence. It may be different with respect to different policy areas. Maybe we should learn from the recent crisis that the European Union should not aim towards an ever-increasing number of policy fields for which it wants to be responsible. Maybe it should concentrate on certain core businesses and leave the other things to the nations, to the regions, uh, to the local autonomies. And in this sense, we might be able to disaggregate crisis functionally, although it might be difficult to disaggregate crisis regionally. Okay, there's a question at the back. I will come with the microphone. Thanks a lot. Uh, my question is actually, you start off your talk by talking about uh, the peace and the EU, the importance for, uh, for bringing in the EU as a part of the peace process and, and a peaceful period in Europe. Uh, then you talk about the integration by the end of your talk. Are, you, are we sure that more integration will get equals peace in Europe, or are we and less conflicts? If we look into Ukraine today, is that a reaction from the East on more integration in Europe, or what do you think about the borders and what happens if we integrate even more in European Union? Different speeds, I think are indispensable for such a heterogeneous and complex body. They are on the way. They have the differences of speed, to use this metaphor, have increased over the last uh, decades. And I think it would be wrong to try to pull this back uh, for the sake of more homogeneity. And. Uh, it follows from the high degree of internal differentiations, not only differentiation in economic terms, but also in terms of culture, history, customs, uh, political priorities. However, this makes governing the whole system more difficult. Political scientists uh, know much better than I do how difficult it is to even analyze the processes which coordinate and govern this uh, strange system, which is neither a federation nor a federal state, nor a confederation. And the different levels of governance uh, are uh, tremendously different from each other. So different speeds may have the cost of more difficult governance. And this is not only a technical problem, but if you want more democracy, uh, you see how difficult it is. These are so complex processes and so difficult to understand that any direct democratic attempt to solve them is uh, hopeless. So it's not only a technocratic problem, it's also a democratic problem to have this complexity of governance as a consequence of different speeds and other factors. But I think it's necessary. Um, Ukraine borders, um, it seems to me that being inside the EU and being outside the EU is not a clear dichotomic difference. In fact, the difference between being in and between out is a gradual one. There are so many uh, uh, affiliations, associations, 
uh, agreements between uh, different uh, countries which are not members of the EU that uh, you sometimes cannot really may see much difference between being a member or being outside. And Norway, in some ways, is an example. Switzerland is another one. And uh, all the dis discussions with Turkey may not finally lead to a full uh, uh, membership of Turkey, but may lead to such a network of uh, agreements and affiliations that, for all practical reasons, they become merely a member. Without voice, however, as you know. Um, so borders are redefined in the case of the Union. You, I prefer to speak of border spaces than of border lines. Ukraine, difficult. But it seems to me that, uh, that if we try to analyze the processes which led into this crisis, it is important to see that the European Union uh, has played a slightly expansionist card and uh, has uh, at least um, raised hopes inside the Ukraine to get near to the European Union. And among the many factors which uh, explain the present crisis, this has been one. There is no complete innocence in this uh, international game. Uh, um, this does not mean to accept any dismembering of the Ukraine which threatens right now. Other comments or questions? Thank you very much for a very interesting talk and uh, for your very good answers. It is, um, we are in a university and as such it's interesting as part of a country that's not inside the EU to, to, to be a member of, of certain arenas as we are within uh, the research projects that we, or the, the instrument, within the instruments that the EU have uh, yeah. taken um, into their hands uh, within uh, research and education. Yeah. Um, we, uh, we, we can see the benefits of such a system where we can partake and build networks and, and build fellowships and arenas like the ERA, the, the, the European Research uh, Area. Um, we've also seen that um, the consequences of uh, greater numbers of European youngsters getting higher education. And will this backfire? As we see that a growing number of the unemployed youngsters in Europe are highly educated and also unemployed. Do you have any sort of ideas about or thoughts about this? In Germany, we have this debate right now. And uh, it was interesting to see that uh, uh, speakers on the left, uh, on left of the center, social democratic uh, uh, environment, uh, came out uh, recently, once a month ago, saying, let's not overdo our attempts to get people into the universities. Uh, uh, there are other forms of qualified education and training which are worthwhile to be supported. And in the German case, it's the so-called dual system which combines practical apprenticeship in firms and uh, with shops at, uh, in the practice. On the one hand, with a certain kind of vocational school training paralleling it. Um, and uh, as far as the labor market uh, uh, sh shows, uh, uh, there is in, in our demographic situation where our population is not anymore growing except by immigration. Uh, there is increasingly uh, the danger that uh, skilled, um, skilled technical and manual labors uh, is lacking. 
So maybe the European Union uh, might discover this as a field to think about uh, uh, whether uh, it is uh, uh, reasonable uh, to uh, think about demand and supply uh, in, this, uh, in this field. But it seems to me that countries, again, differ very much in this respect. And what may be good for one may not be good for the other. Uh, but I share the uncertainty which you express in, in, in your question. And it seems to me that uh, there is not yet enough open discussion about the question whether the long cherished drive towards getting more people into tertiary education may have been very reasonable for a certain period of development, but one may reach a point where one has to rebalance these uh, attempts. Um, you said that there is no exit possibilities or no, no rules for exiting the union. Uh, and I was thinking, you know, when you grow from five members to 20 something, the, um, it seems a bit naive to think that the situation wouldn't arise when that somebody wants to get out again. There are a lot of rules for entering. So, so why, why do you think there is no rules for exiting? Well, I don't know. I haven't studied this. I don't know whether there have, have been, perhaps somebody else knows, whether there have been debates in the uh, preparation of the treaties of uh, Maastricht or Lisbon, uh, debates about whether such treaties should uh, contain uh, provisions for exiting. It could be that uh, you don't want to open such a door uh, because it might be inviting people to use it. And if you want to build such a as close union as possible, you may not want to have such a door. In fact, this kind of thinking has been influential throughout the history of this integration. People in the around 1990 could know, and I think if they really dealt with the, uh, with the issues, they knew that it would be tremendously risky to have a common currency without having a common fiscal and economic policy. But then you try, you hope that the crisis which will emerge will lead to the next further step instead of moving back. In a way, it's this expectation of crisis combined with hope that it will be solved, that the crisis will be solved in a progressive way. And maybe not opening the door for exit is part of this gamble. And this gamble has worked for a couple of decades. Thank you. Uh, I have a last question myself, if no one <laughs> raises your hand really quickly. Um, the process of European integration has been packed with discussions over different issues. And as historians, we discuss th those topics and the material that comes out of those topics. These are the sources we discuss. Now, we also studies, study absence. Sometimes there are debates that are not there, there are blank spots, there are things, uh, topics that you might think would want to come up or would come up in, in processes of this type. You touched slightly upon that uh, question. Could you elaborate on this? What, does, what, is it, what is most surprising when it comes to themes that the union do not deal with? Are there areas of blank spots that uh, uh, might be interesting to have a look at? And, if a young historian asks you, 
what would you recommend me to study if I want to study European integration? I want to go into a new field. I want to have a look at something that historians didn't study before. Uh, I want to study this, these processes. Are there any interesting fields, new questions that you would advise people to have a look at? In history, um, the move towards global history has been a major drive and partly innovation over the last 15 years or so. That doesn't mean that most historians are nowadays global historians, they are not. Uh, nor does it mean that I ask, uh, that I would you know, urge uh, people to, uh, to, to, to change into global history. But uh, in many ways, this attempt to crisscross borders, to think about broad comparison, and to reconstruct entanglements, uh, interconnections, has been a very fruitful and provocative uh, trend in our, my discipline, in our discipline in history uh, over the last 10, 12 years. And I think it's in this connection that uh, the European integration should be re-studied and reformulated. I mean, it's uh, one of the very few uh, uh, responses, I think rational responses, to this globalization of uh, our time. Not enough, because uh, as you can see with respect to regulating finance capitalism, it's not enough to be uh, we have consensus within the Union, and we don't have the consensus within the Union on that between the British and the continent. But even if we had, uh, it would be different in New York and in Singapore as far as the uh, regulation of uh, uh, finance uh, 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 practices are concerned. So Europeanization, even if it worked, uh, w wouldn't be enough uh, to solve this problem of an increasingly globalized capitalism. And remember, uh, the extent to which we were successful in kind of civilizing capitalism or taming it depended very much on strong nation states, which developed the welfare states and put it through against resistance. And now we have a globalized capitalism, but not really a transnational stateness, which would be al pari, or which would, would be strong enough to check these uh, uh, market-based uh, capitalist processes. So here is a big problem. I don't, the problem is clear, the answer is not clear. But it would be worthwhile to use such a problem in order to look into the history of the common market of the uh, European community, and finally, uh, as a European Union, and develop new kinds of questions in this uh, respect. So there would be a, a lot uh, uh, to do, but also, of course, with respect to certain, I mean, why was there, why is there no exit provision in these things, in these uh, treaties? One would have to go back to the discussions and see whether somebody saw this problem, who saw it, who did not want to see it, and why. So, I mean, there may be, in, in the light of the present difficulty, and in the light of the processes towards globalization, many new questions which will help to restudy this. It's understudied, I would say, by historians, the process of European integration is not well studied. There are major books, of course, and, uh, but it's much, economists and political scientists have done more on that, and historians still have a lot to do. It's also, of course, interesting to look into those countries which were invited to join and didn't want to join. <laughs> and uh, that's, uh, but you know, there must be, of course, a lot of literature in Norway on that, which I am not, it's not accessible to me. Thank you again. Uh, again, you have reminded us that we can't understand uh, present day society well without 
including a historical uh, perspective. And now this perspective is not complete and it's not one, it's many perspectives, but they are still historical. Uh, thank you. Our gift to you is um, this uh, four volume Norwegian history that I contributed to myself. It is from 2011. And we brought this because we thought it would uh, say something about how you, how your work and your inspiration has resonated beyond uh, the fields and borders where you normally look for, for uh, inspiration. When you, when you consider the effect of your work, as we sometimes do <laughs> when we look uh, back. I think if you look at history writings in many countries, if you look at research, if you look at what students read, and if you look at what they need to know and the perspectives that are in the curriculum, what students do at the exam, and what they do as the normal way, uh, the, the normal way to work and speak about history. I think uh, if you could read Norwegian and a lot of Scandinavian languages, you would see the traces of your work in the way people uh, approach themes, the way they write about it, uh, and the way they train their students to. Uh, now, maybe you will learn Scandinavian languages once, <laughs> and this uh, might contribute uh, to it. But uh, as you can see, they have uh, those books, they have this, um, they call book tales. They are new inventions. It's, it's supposed to say to you that you have to choose your history, make you conscious of the book you choose and pull out of the bookshelf, and also that you always carry your history with you. You can ignore it, <laughs> and you can choose another history, but to understand the world completely and understand yourself, you, you need to carry the history with you. So this is our gift to you. It goes all the way up to 2011, and it has been designed by Snöhetta, uh, uh, one of the famous Norwegian design uh, company. So I think you will find many of these national histories around the world that has traces of your work and inspiration beyond what you normally measure from the lists of uh, literature behind the books. Thank you for one more uh, great example of, of, uh, of this. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you, thank you very much for this gift. If the content is as innovative <laughs> as the format, I mean, it is very, very promising. And I'm, uh, I'm satisfied to see that there are also many beautiful photos and pictures inside. And for an illiterate person like me, this will be uh, one access to the book. But perhaps I pick up some more. <laughs> thank you very much. It's a pleasure. And thank you for organizing this. And many thanks for the hospitality and for the invitation, uh, both uh, thanks to this university and, of course, to the Holberg uh, uh, Foundation as well. It was a great uh, pleasure and honor uh, to come back. <laughs>